Some forms of atheism, dogmatic and intolerant, justly deserve the psalmist's indignation. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Today, however, there is another kind of atheism altogether, puzzled, wistfully wishing there might be a God, but finding it difficult to think there really is. And about that, one cannot be indignant. Rather, such souls need the understanding attitude of the master toward the man who cried, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Our sermon, then, is not an attack on atheism, nor even an argument for theism, as though one could swiftly marshal reasons like squadrons and march them to a victorious proof of God. Our aim is more modest. The sympathetic endeavor to suggest to some who are finding it hard to believe in God considerations which may make their problems simpler and its effect upon their life less perilous. For one thing, one might say to them that no one believes in all of God. No one can. All of God is too vast to be comprehended in anybody's faith. We cannot even believe in all of the physical universe. How can we? It's too great. It has been remarked of Mrs. Einstein that she did not understand Mr. Einstein's ideas of cosmic mathematics and said so frankly, but that she did understand something much more important to her. She understood Mr. Einstein. We, we all are thrown back on some such attitude. We cannot take in the whole cosmos, but often what is most important to us, we can grasp and believe in. <clears throat> now, true about the physical universe, this is even more true about God. Many people lose faith in God because they're not willing to take him, shall I say, in installments and believe in as much of him as they can, starting rather with an all or none attitude and finding all of God too great for their comprehension, they feel thrown back on disbelief. But friend, in dealing with the idea of God, the most profound reality one can think about, such an all or none attitude is preposterous. No, believe in as much of God as you can. The, the all or none attitude is evidenced, for example, in people who come to the minister and ask him for his definition of God, as though God could be defined. A little girl asked how she drew her pictures, once answered, first I have a think, and then I put a line around it. Excellent as a description of artistry, that will not do in theology. One cannot have a think about God and then put a line around it not the God whose judgments are unsearchable, as the New Testament says, and his ways pass tracing out. Far more modestly than that, a man must believe in as much of God as he can. Now, some here may feel that this is typical of vague modernism lacking the clear, definitely outlined idea of God our fathers used to have. But that shows how little we know about our fathers at their best. Who was it said, at present 
we see only the baffling reflections in a mirror. That was St. Paul, who was it said, all that can be said about God is not God, but only certain smallest fragments which fall from his table. That was St. Catherine of Genoa in the 16th century. Who was it said, God's essence indeed is incomprehensible, utterly transcending all human thought. That was John Calvin. Who was it said our safest eloquence concerning God is our silence? When we confess without confession that his glory is inexplicable, his greatness above our capacity and reach, he is above, and we upon earth. Therefore it behooveth our words to be wary and few. That was Hooker, a great Christian leader of the 16th century. Our forefathers at their best did not have that little neatly outlined God whom we have sometimes heard presented in Protestant pulpits but a God so great that standing before him in humble awe, they knew they could not comprehend him all and believed in as much of him as they could. Well, this comforts me on days when I find faith difficult. I'm not called on to believe in all of God. I cannot. He's too great. But as for disbelieving all that the word God stands for, I can't do that either, not even on dark days. Here and now we verily live in two worlds, one visible, tangible, physical, the other invisible, intangible, spiritual. The rocks we touch are not more real to us than our love of goodness, truth, beauty, and the visitations of divinity are not strange to us. There are hours when we know that the realest forces in this world are spiritual. God says the New Testament is love. So, there always is some of God we can believe in. Well, do at least that much. Not saying, I disbelieve. Putting the weight of your affirmation on the negative side. But saying, I will believe in as much of the divine as I can. For then you join a great company of souls upon whom the Master has looked with sympathetic understanding. As they said, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. <clears throat> uh, again, to those who are having difficulty in their faith about God, we might say that while philosophically, we may deny God. Psychologically, we always have a God. Every member of this congregation is instinctively a worshiper, giving himself to something, making a God of it and serving it, so that even when we get rid of God, Philosophically, we, we never get rid of him psychologically. Alas, a whole nation can rid itself of the real and living God in Christ, but always some fearer or other takes his place. Everybody has a God. Now, in this last generation in this country, Many people giving up God philosophically have concocted all sorts of psychological substitutes for him, 
saying, for example, that God is like Uncle Sam or Alma Mater, a picturesque, imaginative symbol of our group devotion and enthusiasm, so that when at commencement time we go back to our college and sing praise to Alma Mater, that's exactly like religious worship. The idea of God, they say, is like Alma Mater, not philosophically real, but useful as an imaginative picture of our social loyalties. So, feeling inwardly the deep need of God, they make of him really only a figment of the imagination. A pathetic situation that to have your psychological needs pulling one way and your philosophical convictions pulling another, wanting a transcendent object of loyal devotion in a universe where you think that really there is nothing to be transcendently loyal to. Well, I for one cannot escape the conviction that there is in this universe something, someone, to be transcendently loyal to. The most moving moment to me in the worship of the midshipmen here on Sunday evening is when at the service is closed, the color bearers come into the chancel to get the flags, the flag of the Corps and the flag of the nation. And then in solemn silence, turn toward the altar and dip the colors to the cross as though to say that above all earthly devotions, there is in this universe a being to whom our supreme devotion belongs, and that the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Friends, it will not do so deeply to need God and still to deny his reality. <clears throat> not only does that tear life in two, but, but intellectually, a philosophy which thus leaves out what is deepest in man's life has something the matter with it. Whatever else philosophy gives a just account of, it, it should take in what is profoundest in man's life. If someone here is finding belief difficult while still, like all the rest of us, having experiences which suggest God and needs which cry out for God, I say to him, trust what is deepest in yourself. Man, if you cannot trust what is deepest in your life, what can you trust in this strange universe? And since what is deepest in your life lifts up its hands for God, have as great a God as you can. Don't thin him down and wash him out and make merely Uncle Sam or Alma Mater of him. That surely is not the last word about a great matter like God. <clears throat> Dr. Rufus Jones, our Quaker friend, says that a kindly gentleman summering on the main coast and discovering on an island offshore a group of children who were receiving no religious training, went out on Sunday mornings to instruct them. On the first day, wishing to start with something familiar, 
He asked all of them who had ever seen the Atlantic Ocean to raise their hand. Not a hand went up. He thought they were shy, so he pressed the question. But they were quite in earnest. They had never seen the Atlantic Ocean. All their lives they'd lived in it. Their boats had been sailed on it. Its waters had sung their lullaby at night when they were babes, and the rhythmic beat of its waves upon the shore had waked them in the morning. Only they did not know that it was the Atlantic Ocean. How like to them many of us are about God. All that is deepest in our spiritual life is the near end of him. All the best in us is God in us. We cannot run away from him. As soon as we deny him, we start calling him by other names and making up substitutes for him. Since then, we must have a God. Let's have a great one. Not saying, I disbelieve, but saying, Lord, I believe. Help, help thou mine unbelief. <clears throat> Once more, if we are finding it difficult to believe in God, let us not forget that there are towering difficulties in the way of disbelief in God. Of course, it's difficult to believe in God. The psalmist, in a confident mood, said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And everyone remembers that. But most people forget that the psalmist also said, O oh Lord, why hidest thou thy face from me? Who can look at the vast stellar spaces, unmeasured and immeasurable, and easily saturate them with kindly purpose? Who can regard the strange history of this planet with its volcanic furies, its huge and useless beasts, its cruel parasitic life, its strange evolving miseries, and not find it difficult to fit a good God in. Who can look out today upon this violent world or bear, it may be, in his own life the shocks of an unkindly fate, and find it easy to say, our Father, a man who thinks it's easy to believe in God does not know what believing in God means. So for you, it may be difficult, yet far from being discouraged about you religiously, I should say that you might yet join the succession of the great believers for the great believers have always been those who, finding it hard to believe in God, have found it harder still to disbelieve. Who of us that loves music, for example, has not come from some high hour when beauty reign supreme, absolutely certain that the materialistic explanation of the universe would never do such beauty. The minds that created it and the souls that have loved it could not be the accidental consequence of colliding atoms. When a modern atheist says that life is merely a physiological process with merely 
a physiological meaning. That's nonsense. And as Professor Montague of Barnard College put it, the chance of that being true would have to be represented by a fraction with one for the numerator and a denominator that would reach from here to the fixed stars. See, hard as it is sometimes to believe in God in all our greater hours, it's far more difficult to disbelieve in him. If someone says, but look at the appalling agony of the world now, I say yes, but the agony of war, which we humans brought upon ourselves, is an argument not so much against God as for him. <clears throat> the first implication of the existence of God is that we live in a moral order where men and nations can no more break moral than physical laws with impunity. Who was it said, if you eat salt herring, not even the grace of God will keep you from being thirsty? I should say so. This agony we face today is what the Lord Chancellor in Gilbert and Sullivan's opera Eolanthe called an affidavit from a thunderstorm. That's what war's awful consequences are, an affidavit from a thunderstorm that we are living in a moral order where men and nations cannot disobey moral law with impunity. And such a moral order is an argument not against God, but for him. As for life's beauty and loveliness, there is so much of it that as the years pass, I find it ever more difficult to disbelieve in God. Look even at this vast stellar universe, <laughs> unified. Not a multiverse, but a universe coherent and integrated, orderly. Not whimsical and capricious, but with never a slip anywhere between cause and consequence. Simple. Yes, simple, with less than a hundred elements in it whose formulas, when we grasp them, bind everything together into uniformity from here to the farthest star. And intelligible, as though mind having made it, mind could enter into and understand it. Well, read the great scientists and see it's desperately difficult to ascribe all this to chance and disbelieve in God. And when one comes closer home to think of souls near and dear through whom the divine life has shined, the homes from which we came, the, the mothers whom we recollect with deathless gratitude, the fathers who cared for us, the children who have come to us, the, the friends who have nurtured us. To say that such spirits are but accidents, without roots in eternal fact, bearing no news of what is ultimate, and that we never have seen the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in a face like Christ's. That is difficult to think. So, you see, the fact is that in our great hours, we do believe in God. Instinctively, we do believe in God. 
They say that under the early Soviet regime, a Russian girl took a civil service examination, and after the examination was over, she was very anxious as to whether she had passed. In particular, she worried about one question, what is the inscription on the Sarmian wall? She had written down what she thought it was. Religion is the opiate of the people. But after she was through with the examination, she walked seven miles from Leningrad to the Sarmian Wall to be sure. And there it was, just as she had written, religion is the opiate of the people. And then instinctively she fell upon her knees and crossed herself and said, thank God. Of course it's hard to believe in God. The problem of this universe is vast and deep. But friends, it's harder yet to disbelieve in him. Lord, I believe, help. Help thou mine unbelief. Finally, if we think it difficult to believe in God, let's ask ourselves whether we would not like to have this a world where our children will find it easier to believe in him than we have found it. Most people who disbelieve in God do it because they are discouraged about life. We Christians are often told that our faith in God is wishful thinking, a fantasy world to which we run away for comfort from life's stern realities. Well, faith is a comfort. It's backing sustenance and security in times like these. Our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. That is a comfort. An atheist may call such an experience fantasy, but he must confess that it's keeping multitudes of people out of the insane asylum. Moreover, if one insists that our faith in God is the rationalizing of our wishes and our hopes, one answer to the atheist is clear. Your denial of God is mostly the rationalizing of your discouragements and disillusionments. Yes, it is. Nine-tenths of the atheism in the United States, I suspect, is not the result of intellectual argument, but it is the rationalization of discouragement. Take frustration and bafflement, anxiety and fear, futility and grief. Pile them so high that a man cannot see over them or around them. And not far off is the cry, there is no God. If some of our faith in God is wishful thinking, most of our denial of God is discouraged thinking. Plenty of people come to me to talk about God, with whom I do not bother to talk about God. Help the man. That's the first thing to be done. Throw a little friendliness around him. Lift, if you can, an intolerable burden off him. Let some light shine into his darkness. Faith in God will often take care of itself if you give a man a chance. And if now in these critical days we could open the door into a new era of hope for the world, lifting the fear of war from the human spirit, 
my soul, how across the earth a resurgence of faith would come. Millions feeling so there is a God after all. Let's say it to ourselves then one by one this morning. I can make my life an argument for God. I can help make this world the kind of place where our children will find it easier to believe in him than it has been for us. For God is a living presence, the great pioneer, lifting an ensign for the peoples and calling us to follow him for a more just and decent world. We must not deny that God. We must not say no to him. Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Let us pray. <clears throat> Eternal Spirit, who hast so strangely set us small creatures in the midst of so great a universe, and yet with thoughts that plumb the depths and wander through eternity, by large outlooks and deep insights and great faiths, make us adequate for the living of these days. Amen. <clears throat>